folks. Welcome to episode 57 of Funny Book Splatter, a horror comics podcast brought to you by HorrorTalk.com. I am your host, James Ferguson. Well, I've got a twofer for you this week with Lonnie Nadler and Zach Thompson, the writers of Coming to Me, reviewing on March 14th from Black Magic Studios. Quick note on the release date, you'll hear me say that the book comes out on March 7th. That was the original scheduled release date due to some scheduling issues or whatever. Uh, the book's got pushed back a week, so Coming to Me number one will be out on March 14th. It's not out yet, it'll be out on March 15th. Okay? You may also recognize their names from The Dregs, also from Black Mask, and Cable from Marvel Comics. That's a little tiny public you know, I, hope, I hope they make it. Anyway, Cover to Me is a creepy body horror comic that deals with social media and technology. I read it a few weeks ago and it is still haunting me. Lonnie can be found on Twitter as at Lon underscore Monster. And Zach can be found on Twitter as at Zach B. Thompson. B is B. In other news, former guest of the show, Pat Chan, has launched a new Kickstarter that you'll probably be interested in. It's called Prison Witch, and it's described as Orange is the New Black meets the Crack. Also on Kickstarter is Transdimensional Number 3 from former guest, Mike Gordon. He's looking him back when he launched the first issue, so I'm excited to see where this is. Hello. Hello. Sci-Fi Horror Series. Hey, how you going? I'm good, how you doing? Not too bad, this is Lonnie, and back here also. Hey, hello. This is, uh, I think it's the first exactly. time I've, I've had a... Um, you know, a double, a double uh, guess where you guys were in the same spot. So, uh, I'm very intrigued how all this will shake out. Yeah, sure. we, we make it easy, but we also sound exactly the same. So, <laughs> it, uh, it's a lot of monotone dudes speaking. <laughs> hey, I, I know the feeling. Um, all right, so uh, look, I'll, I'll, um, I, uh, I try to make this uh, as easy as I can. Uh, this is a, uh, it's a, convers- a conversational show. My goal for for this is to, in tone to be like the nerdist for horror comics. So um, awesome. I want to try to avoid asking you like the same five questions you probably get asked in every interview. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of stuff will probably just come up, or, you know, as we talk. But I'm not going to sit there and be like, "Well, how'd you get the idea?" Or you know, what? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I can't. Um, <laughs> we appreciate that very much. <laughs> Um, but I will tell you, like full disclosure, the first thing I, I ask though is is for you to describe the book. That's that I found from like a format standpoint gives every everyone that uh you know kind of a a level playing field going into it because I I started this show realizing like selfishly I already know about this book so I'm just gonna jump right in. But then I recognized <laughs> people that might just be listening and having no idea what this book is about or who you guys may be. Then it's like oh they have no idea what I'm talking about. So, right, right, yeah, that makes sense. So that's how I started, but otherwise, yeah, it's um, you know, we'll we'll I I have a bunch of questions, but we'll we'll talk about the book, the the horror genre a bit, and just kind of whatever else comes up. All right. So, now before I I get too far, I want to make sure I'm I'm also pronouncing your names right. So um, Lo, is it Lonnie Nadler? That's right. And Zach Thompson. I feel like that one's easy. <laughs> yeah, you got it. All right, perfect. <laughs> you, you guys, you guys are easier. I, I, I dealt with a few folks, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know where to start, and then I, inevitably I butcher their names by the end, or I, or even if I ask, I, I like, I flinch at the last minute when I'm doing the closer, and then screw it all up. So, yeah, we've been in the opposite position. <laughs> we've been on your end of this, yeah. so we, well, we know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right, so you ready to get started? Yeah, yeah, whenever you are. All man. right, so. Again, to start, my my first and hopefully only cheesy interview question I'm going to ask you is how do you, how would you describe your book if you had to pitch someone coming to me uh, that might be just walking down the street I guess and you're sh- you're shouting at them or you're you're at a convention floor and you want to tell them about the book how would you pitch the book to them? I'm gonna let Zach take this. <laughs> okay, uh, <clears throat> it's because I was wincing. Uh, <laughs> We, we basically tried to pitch the book as if David Cronenberg directed an episode of Black Mirror. Um, we want to take the, like, body horror genre that was popularized with, like, the fly and video drome and the work of David Cronenberg and explore it through the lens of social media. Um, so bringing body horror into the social media age. Well, well said. I, I think, that, you know, the David Cronenberg and Black Mirror kind of, like, seals the deal there, so. <laughs> yeah, this the body horror aspect of it like hits you right from the beginning with this like the idea of I don't I, I don't even know what you would call some of the technology that you have in this uh in this book but th- like this weird 
like meat needle thing that kind of like <laughs> shoved into the back of someone's neck. Like, like, like that's creepy as hell, man. Like, where? <laughs> yeah. So how? <laughs> yeah, we actually have names for like all of the technology, pretty much that we have in the book, and we talk to people, and they're like, that like weird phallic thing that has a needle coming out of it. And we're like, oh yeah, that's the like appendage that goes in the back <laughs> of people's neck. You know, just that. But that's, like, literally pa- page one, like, the second panel is this weird, like, tendril of meat, and then, like, you go through and there's just, like, a bunch of, like, ropes of muscle or something, like, and and it really, like, it's all, per- it's all like, shown wordlessly to start, and you're like, I don't know what I'm just getting into. And that's pa- <laughs> page one. Page one is all this, like, weird f- flesh machinery that is, uh, it's in there, so, <laughs> like... How how does a de- yeah, was- how does a design like that kind of come about? Like is that like you know I guess you could start with wires and things, but then it's like well here's every like picture picture your normal laboratory but cover everything in meat like kind of yeah I mean like we talked a lot about like wet tech oh. like the idea of like the like flesh being like part of a computer and like we were uh, we used like the game pods from Ezextends as like a, a reference oh, point. Yeah. So- like weird pieces of flesh. And we really love the idea of just like putting you in a world where it's like, this exists. Like we're not going to explain why or how it's just, it does. And you have to deal with it. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah, there's no real explanation as to like how this technology came about or like, Oh, we're, we're, we're suddenly on the, on the verge of a big, well, I guess, I guess it is somewhat in a breakthrough in that like it is, it is like about to hit mainstream. Like they're figuring out exactly what yeah. they have on their hands, but like, you don't really need to know, like, oh, well, I did research for th- for you know ten years, and and we did this, we did these testing on rats, and first, you know, yeah, you don't need uh, that. You're just gonna hit the ground running with uh, with this weird mind meld kind of thing. So, yeah, we see a lot of books, uh, not just comics, but whether it's novels or films or whatever medium you're working in, and there's people who work in science fiction, especially. I think a lot of the time, like production companies or publishers, like are worried that audiences won't understand it, so they'll meddle in it and make them over-explain everything. And then you just wind up with like a half hour of expository Ugh. dialogue where everyone's explaining how all this stuff exists, and it's just like nobody ever wants that <laughs> in any science fiction movie. So we just sort of were like, you know what, we're foregoing all of that we're just going to start you like in the middle of the story and uh hopefully people understand it i mean we took the page out of cronenberg's book too right like i mean if you think about the fly even like they don't spend any time explaining how seth brundle created the telepods he just has them already (laughs) and you're like well i have questions but you know what fuck it this movie's dope so i don't care (laughs) I, i think that's starting to be more of a trend now or, or maybe it could just be more in comics lately where i think it's like you're you're understanding that the reader has some level of under of like intelligence and does it need every single thing spelled out for them like you can have a bit of nuance there and you can kind of like say like all right you're you know you're with me here right like you know we're we're okay and you just kind of keep going but yeah that that need to explain everything like like how many times have we seen, you know, um, uh, Bruce Wayne's parents get killed in a movie? Like, there's only so many, like, all right, we, we get yeah. it. You don't have to reintroduce that uh, every single time to, in order to explain everything else that he's doing. Like, Yeah. That's, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, because, it, again, it, it does make, I think, for a more intelligent storyline. But also, like, you're, you, I'm sure you save a ton of space in the book if you don't have to sit there and, and explain the whole background as to how all this stuff goes. You're, and plus, you're able to do a lot of that visually. I think so. Yeah, exactly. also, it goes toward creating a mood also, right? If you're putting people in a world where you have this strange stuff and you don't explain it, it, it creates an air of mystery around it. And it's sort of riding that fine line between something like uh, under the skin where you don't really know what's going on the whole time, but you understand it emotionally. And then something like, I don't know, uh, I didn't even see the most recent Flatliners movie, but I assume they spend a lot of time like explaining how this technology <laughs> exists, right? And you want to... You don't want to alienate your audience completely, but you don't want to over-explain things. So we, we try to ride a line. Yeah, there's, there's a fine line there. I mean, I I have to say I didn't I didn't particularly care for Under the Skin. I only saw it recently, but I, I think I want to read the there's a book. It's based on a book, and I want to I want to read yeah, that a- because I feel like there was like some nuance to the book that I that that didn't quite make it into the movie for me. So. 
Yeah, there's definitely a lot more in the in the book. Yeah, so I, I definitely still want to check it out because like it it seems like a cool story, but I'm just like I'm not really sure. Like, give me just something to go on here because at the end of the day, like, what did yeah, I just right. watch? Um, yeah, exactly. Like for like, I love that movie, but for some people, it's just it's uh, it doesn't resonate if. if because it gives you so yeah, little. Yeah, and right? it's like, all right, that was that I felt like was a little bit too on the other side of the spectrum, where it's like I needed just just a little bit more <laughs> there. Yeah, but certainly no hand yeah. holding. No, not even a little bit. <laughs> so the 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 social networking aspect, this there there is this kind of like mind meld to it, where it, I mean, if I'm understanding the technology, the, the way the 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 technology seems to work, is that you kind of like hop into someone else's body for a little bit. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. So, right. like, this is this is like a really next level of a social network. It's like, all right, you're sharing pictures of everything you've ever done, and you know all, all these aspects of your life and your life events, and and all these things you're doing. But now it's like, oh, let's no, take a ride in 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 my brain for a little bit and see share. Now, what I guess what level of sharing goes on there? Is it like if someone gets into your head, like, do they just have access to everything you've ever done, every memory you have? Yeah, so it's it's tough to to kind of go into it we talked a lot about it and did a lot of research about memory and how the brain works and we realized it wouldn't be sort of you go into someone else's mind and you instantly know everything about their history right because when you're sitting there on a regular basis you don't you're not remembering your entire history of yourself right so you sort of have to dig around or when the other person thinks of something you would think of it too or if you're digging around in their brain and certain synapses are firing it might uh trigger certain images uh, so it's a, it's a process of discovery that the other person has to go through once they're inside your body. And the longer you're there, the more you can manipulate that process to kind of access information that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So it's kind of like this idea of like the book kind of came from this idea of like oversharing, like the like looking at people's social media profiles and then talking way too much mm-hmm. about their personal lives. If you were in someone's head while they were doing those kinds of things, how could you leverage that? How deep would that go? And what's it like to lose control once someone starts to know how to manipulate that process? Wow. Like, all of this sounds really creepy. Uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm imagining, like, this could have, it, you know, really scary repercussions for something like, um, in, in, you know, interrogation or, or, Military, military use of of you know people if you're if you're trying to to get information out of somebody and you could just you know hook into their brain that that changes a lot of things in in terms of how they can go about getting access to that kind of stuff yeah exactly it's the kind of technology where at, at the start our protagonist sebastian believes it should be used for medicine and for certain purposes but he sort of changes mm-hmm. his mind uh as the issue goes along and, and it's, you know, it's such a groundbreaking technology that we're working with that there's so many uses for it for so many different, uh, different fields of work. Uh, so there's a lot of potential, but we found in grounding it like right at the cusp of it becoming public, it was easiest because then you don't have to go into what other people yeah. might use it for, but maybe down the line somewhere people like the book enough. We'll explore <laughs> military torture tactics. <laughs> See, there's always a market. Uh, that, that, that's your expansion. Um, the <laughs> when in doing research for the book, I know you're talking about uh, memory and stuff. Is there any um, thing like this that you've seen in reality? Yeah, there was one thing that came up. We like Zach and I started this book like four years ago. So there was a study that came out from researchers at the University of Washington um, in like 2012 or 2013. And they had linked two people together through a computer. And if I was linked to you, I would be able to like move your, your arm or move your fingers or whatever. Um, so there, it's called brain to brain networking or oh, something yeah, weird yeah. like that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that was sort of a uh, inspiration for it. Once we figured out we wanted to talk about like oversharing mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, but just the fact that like, you know, that technology exists and it's five years old at this point. Yeah. It's like, and why is nobody talking about this on like, a regular <laughs> basis? There's a, there's a type of technology called like neuromorphic technology that works on like replicating brain tissue. And so that's how we've kind of like angled this flesh computer to exist. It's like, it's, it's simulated brain tissue. But I mean, even then on top of that, like outside of technology, we're looking at studies about how people 
studied memory in relation to like social media and how that's completely changed the way that people perceive themselves. Like we perceive ourselves to be this like a summation of all these individual moments that are unchanging because we have social media profiles that are kind of like locked in. And so the only way that you actually understand yourself is by revisiting those pictures and looking at them. But by its very nature, memory is way more fluid and, and changes based on the context that you're in. And we've kind of lost that sense of ourselves at this point. So we're kind of reopening that can of worms with this book. Yeah, I forget what researcher that was, but it, it came from uh, Warren Ellis. Is, is, uh, Warren Ellis' yeah. newsletter. Yeah. 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 He saved us. <laughs> yeah, he's usually a, a good for any of like, that technology that's going to freak you out and make you want to like go completely off the grid. Uh, that that, that yeah, newsletter exactly. is usually a good read for something like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a real light Sunday read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does always come out on Sundays, too. It's like, oh, yeah, let's see what Warren Ellis is up to. Oh, okay, I'm going to go throw my phone out a window. This is... Uh, Thanks a lot, man. Yeah. Uh, but good on you for making the planetary a few years ago. You know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you you said you you been working on this book for four years, or did you you started it four years ago? How how um how, how was that kind of process to because you've you've obviously done some other stuff in between then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we originally like came together like four years ago and just talked a lot over like double IPAs about like what <laughs> kind of uh, stories we wanted to tell because Lonnie and I met in film school. And over the course of that time, we were both like really heavily into comics and we were kind of like, okay, what are the things that we want to explore in comics? And we kept coming back to like memory and social media and particularly like body horror as a lens to explore those things. And it took us probably like better part of a year to even like refine the idea down to two minds sharing one body. Um, and then from there we turned it into like a five page pitch, which is pretty much the first five pages of the first issue uh, that you'll see, but a little different. And we shopped it around and it was probably way too ambitious for anyone to get on board with. So we actually at the, after that, after that didn't go anywhere, we started to develop the dregs. And then after the dregs came out, People were like, all right, I guess you guys can do this crazy ass book. <laughs> yeah, that was a, a pretty stellar book. They got a ton of attention as well. Um, I know I, I, I think I reviewed all of them. Uh, but yeah, that was just a crazy ass book as well. Um, so have yeah. you guys. Very great reviews too. <laughs> so thank you very much for reading. Um, <laughs> now, have you guys always, uh, kind of been approaching this together from a, a co-writing kind of gig? I guess comics in general. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like we're, we're now at a point where we're starting to branch out on our own and starting to tell our own stories. But for the most part, like Lonnie and I look at comics as a very collaborative process. One of the things that we benefit from, I think is just like co-writing. We sit in the same room. We sit in the same Google doc on two separate computers and literally rewrite the same sentence together until it's perfect. So it's a lot like having <laughs> two minds <laughs> in one script. <laughs> it all comes uh, together. <laughs> and and so it actually works out really, really well because you have this like first you have your first reader there in the room right away. Um and I know like from my own personal experience, it's refined my writing ability quite a bit because you always have someone there to ask important questions. And I think when you're isolated and you're by yourself the only person to ask those questions is you. And sometimes that stunts your movement mm -hmm. on a script. And I think we keep each other like moving a lot. Keep, yeah, definitely. Keep a momentum. Yeah. I think like, like we're definitely interested in exploring our own work uh, and moving in that direction. But I, at the same time, like I, I doubt there'll be a time that Zach and I aren't working on some book together. Yeah. It's just like we, we work really well together. We rarely fight. And even when we do, we resolve it like, pretty quickly we have to <laughs> <laughs> and yeah we uh it just, yeah it's just it's just nice to have someone to write no, with. If, if if you can make that work that's awesome like that's what i was going to ask like how your process how, how you kind of uh, approach a process there but it sounds you, you kind of all outlined it right, <laughs> right there so that i mean i can imagine like if you are mad at each other like you could start you know fucking with the google doc or something but like it's that's only gonna hurt <laughs> yourself anyway so it's like at the end of the day you're both I, working to make a comic book come out and if you if you're disagreeing and, and getting petty like that and it's never gonna happen 
Yeah, we usually disagree over like really small, stupid things. Also, it's like whether or not a character should be asking a question or making a statement and we'll talk about it for like 10 minutes and then be like okay who cares (laughs) often (laughs) often single lines of dialogue (laughs) do you you split anything up like you know does one of you focus more on story versus dialogue or or anything like that or is it just kind of like you know you're you're grabbing uh any anything or taking turns or something I mean, yeah. it's like fully collaborative. It's, yeah. We, we literally sit in the same room for every part of the process. Like the only thing that maybe is a little bit different is like when it comes to doing like research, we kind of go off on our own paths, but we both have like a direction to, to run in. And then we usually just bring each other the research that we did and, and kind of find out where the intersection is. And that's mostly just because it's more mm-hmm. efficient that way. We don't both need to read the same stuff to kind of like start to form the outline or whatever so it's been really good in that regard yeah uh, and the fact that you're in the same spot has to be really helpful instead of like collaborating with uh you know when, when you when you kick it over to the artist like they're i presume they're not also sitting in the same room yeah no <laughs> so our, our artist for this is in uh, poland if so. we had our own way <laughs> yeah, yeah we'd all sit in the same room but I don't think that would be good for him. <laughs> how how <laughs> did uh, how did you guys get with uh, I, I'm I don't I don't know even know how to start to pronounce it. is it Peter P- Peter Kowalski is that my close? Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. How did yeah. you got how did you guys connect to uh to start working on this book? Oh man, like we we've been fans of Peter's work for years, and uh, I reviewed his work on Nightbreed. Um, for Bloody Disgusting, like, five, six years ago, and he added me on Facebook, like, randomly, and then, like, when this book got greenlit, I was like, well, let's just fire him a Facebook message and see if he's down, and he responded, like, a day later, and he was like, yep, and it, it was really interesting, because we have a lot of intersecting interests, and we are really passionate about the same types of things, and we could kind of pick that up from his work, but Peter's like, we feel so lucky to be working with him because he's like an industry veteran and we're kind of like, how do we trick him into working with us? <laughs> yeah. He's, he's really amazing. And like the stuff that he was, we were talking to him the other day. He was like, Oh yeah. Back when I wrote a comic with James Wan and we're like, what? <laughs> like, yeah. He worked with James Wan. He works with Stephen King. Like wow. he's been all over the place. Yeah. Wow. We're just like, we bow down yeah, to you. Is that, like, intimidating, <laughs> then? Or, about, like, you know, like, do you, like, second-guess yourself or anything when you're sending over scripts now to be like, you know, this guy's worked with Stephen King, and I'm over here like, do you want to do you want to draw this meat needle thing? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like if it was uh, if it was in person, mm-hmm. maybe. But, I mean, he's also Polish, and, like, that would probably be kind of scary, too, because yeah. they're, like, quite, uh, like, <laughs> stern, generally. <laughs> but, like, over email, it's pretty... Like I'm not face to face with him, yeah. so I don't have problems. <laughs> I mean, to be like perfectly coward. <laughs> to be perfectly frank, like our whole year has been just kind of intimidating because it's just like we went from writing the drags where we thought no one was ever gonna like that book, and now we're like writing three comic books together, and like it just it doesn't feel real. <laughs> like none of it. We're just like, okay, cool. Like we've loved Peter's work forever and now we have a book coming out with him in like three weeks. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> when does this stop? And yeah. I'll have to like start making my back issues for warmth. Yeah. <laughs> make him a coma. And if so, when will it end? Yeah. Yeah. Is this, is this the make a wish thing that no one told me about? Like, do I have some sort of horrible disease? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys have had a, a somewhat meteoric uh, rise in terms, of, like, because the Dregs was only like your, you know, what was that, like your first? Or, it wasn't, it wasn't your first comic, but like, you know, you're you're still relatively green, I guess I could say. It it was my first comic. Well, you had the one you did for, you had written. I had written a bunch of comics that just mm-hmm. never came out. <laughs> well, see now, now it's like you're. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that, now that's the stuff that would get or, get bubbled back up to the surface because it's like, oh well, what else you got? Well, I have all these other things that are kind of sitting on the shelf. Uh, if people start asking about more work for you, well, it's super interesting because it's like this year we've gotten things picked up and they've been like, they're not even the stuff that we have greenlit now were ideas that we came up with like immediately after the dregs came out. So we have been sitting on them for like a year mm-hmm. almost. And it's super interesting. Cause it's like no one wanted them back then. <laughs> but now after that book came out, it's like 
we it's been very strange like we we were like when are people going to stop saying yes this doesn't seem <laughs> right and it doesn't seem right in the comic book industry in particular but we feel incredibly like fortunate and lucky it's just it's a dream come true on every single level well, you, you 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 make solid books so far so it's just keep doing that <laughs> like you know it's all right if, if people keep saying yes because you're making quality work like that's that's what it really comes down to well, thank you. We don't. No, we're not sure. Yeah, we're not sure. <laughs> people who think so. I can I can understand that because like it's it's something you know you're throwing something out there into the world and it's like sooner or later someone's gonna give you shit about it. Especially since this is the comic book industry and and we do have a very uh we we can be very negative to ourselves um for some reason like it, it's it's some it's a weird hobby that people love to hate about themselves and I don't I don't fully understand it. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, that that kind of mindset. But I, you know, I, I'll, I'll never forget like being in comic book stores and seeing someone like, man, if I ever see you know Joe Quesada, I'm gonna punch him in the face. And this guy is buying like a stack of Marvel comics, you know, as big as his fist. And I'm like, if you hate him so much, why are you buying all this stuff? And like, come on, man. <laughs> so it doesn't, doesn't. That is very true. It's, you see a lot of that kind of thing where it's people like hate yeah. read stuff, and it's like, do you really hate it if you're picking it up every week? And four yeah. bucks for there, there are many yeah. better things to spend your to spend your four bucks on. Like try any <laughs> other comic that comes out from any other publisher. Give that a whirl, like because there's there's plenty <laughs> to choose from. Uh, but yeah, I never I never understood that. It's like, why would you continue to do that if you hate it? Why why do you rail against it so much? But then I, I've 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 heard though that that's also the case in other in other fandoms, like uh, I mean, I'm not I'm not a big sports guy, but apparently like sports is just as you know shitty sometimes where it's like you know you're gonna you're gonna sit there and you know oh, yeah. crap all over your team but like that's your team I'm gonna keep going even though i hate them yeah i, I was a big hockey fan and uh, i used to watch uh montreal canadian games like religiously and i would just sit there and like stew in rage <laughs> at how bad the team was but like weirdly enjoy it and i since stopped doing it because it made me angry and i couldn't sleep at night so no more sports for me. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now you stick to comics and and freaking people out with a uh, with a uh, weird mind meld kind of things you got. Yeah, weirdly, yeah. I sleep all right. Funny, is that how you come? That's how you can come to grips with it. Was uh, so you, you you mentioned when you were, you, and you guys were first starting collaborating, you 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 wanted to do something dealing with body horror, but like what what about that kind of genre interested you? Uh, I mean, like, we're big horror fans, and I think, like, one of the things that Cronenberg does, for me at least, is, like, it localizes a lot of that horror within within the person. Um, it's, like, inescapable. There's something distant for me about slushers and, and, and like, the, the Freddy Kruegers and Jason Voorhees of the world that kind of just chase you around and they want to wanna kill you, but you can kind of get away in a, a certain way. And with Cronenberg's work in particular, it's like, it not only turns your body on you, that's like the most, something you know intimately and are very familiar with, it becomes foreign, but also your mind, right? And it, and it shows that relationship between the body and the mind and is so intimate. And as soon as you start to change, you start to fear yourself, you become something different and makes you into something that you can't control. And I think I love that idea of losing control and degenerating into something awful. And then plus like David Cronenberg is Canadian and we're just like, we got to continue the Canadian <laughs> legacy. We got to be Cronenberg Jr. and Cronenberg so Jr. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're just going to add body horror as like the, the other things that can, that Canada are known for. It's like, all right, yeah, okay. We got, you got yeah, hockey, oh. you got maple syrup, and now yeah, body horror. This is you, you come to Canada, you're going to get <laughs> body horror. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna get a venereal disease for sure. When you're gonna... <laughs> yeah, we could get we should, that that could be a new slogan, right? Yeah, can we get Trudeau on the phone for that one? What? <laughs> we have a great tourism idea. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, going back to to body horror, it's pretty much like Zach said. It's it localizes the horror into something into your body, and that's. The one thing for humanity that's inescapable is the fact that we exist in these physical forms. And when you put it in there, it it, it becomes unescapable, but it also forces us to question 
uh, things about ourselves and the interaction between the mind and the body. And that's always going to be fascinating to me. Yeah. So is there, um, like a particular kind that, that would freak you out more than others? Like if, if, if it had to do with, you know, fingernails or, you know, or, or, or brains or, or guts or something like that. Is that something where it's like, oh, like I'm fine unless it starts, unless they start pulling at ears or something. Well, just anything for me that's anything that's on the body that shouldn't be on the body <laughs> is terrifying to me. I'm, I have a phobia of injections, like of needles. Like I just, I, the idea of a needle piercing my body is horrifying to me. Like I legit go out of my way to avoid getting like flu shots and stuff. I'd rather have the flu than get a flu shot. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's it's a a common uh, uh, fear, so it's not that crazy to to hear that. But yeah, it's um, I can understand the the foreign um, aspect to it uh, certainly that the idea of, of anything being uh, on on a person that's not supposed to be there that's that is pretty freaky. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird that your skin can just like grow things, and it's like why is that there? And it's like oh, there's these like tiny living organisms in you that are you know, affecting your body in a certain way and they shouldn't be there. So now you've got this thing on your arm and it's like, oh, Jesus, and I have to get this amputated? Like, what is going <laughs> on? Well, I, I remember the first time I heard the word, like, what, a skin tag or something? I'm like, what the fuck is that? Like, yeah. wh- where, where, where where does that come from? And, like, I think I saw it, like, it was like an interview with... um it was with Nathan Fillion on like on like uh, David Letterman or something. It's like, oh yeah, you know they had a little skin skin tag and you know I just like cut it off and I'm like, what what, what are you doing? You're just casually cutting shit off of someone's body? Like wh- why? Where, where what kind of situation could you popular pop- possibly be in where it's like, yeah, I'm just gonna cut this off of me? Like that that came that was on you as a <laughs> yeah. person that was attached to you. Like <laughs> yeah, it's it's just like exactly yeah. it's part of you, but it's. It's foreign and, and disturbing and makes you worried if there's something wrong with you, right? If you're not, if your body isn't perfect and smooth, whatever we've been conditioned to believe, there's something wrong with it. <laughs> now I'm gonna be having nightmares now, thinking of all this other weird shit. Um, <laughs> right. I guess uh, you know, you know, I know I said I wasn't gonna ask you cheesy interview questions, but one that it just kind of popped up was, well, was there someone that you would want to mind meld with and 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 pop into their body? Oh boy! Oh man, that is a can of worms. <laughs> God, I honestly don't know if I'd ever want to do that. Yeah, I feel like after writing this book, like we both just know, no, probably I don't think so. Like by yeah, everyone that like comes to mind, I'm like, no, nope, don't want to know that part of their life. Like, yeah, yeah, it is. It is like a really you know, uh, uncomfortable level of intimacy that it's like, all right, I could, I'll follow someone's Instagram, but like to hear, to, to possibly see every thought that may be going through their mind for a given time. Like, yeah. That, and, 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 you know, I think of my own weird thoughts that, that pop up and it's like, yeah, that, that is the, th- those things are private for a reason because otherwise people might think I'm a fucking lunatic. And it's like, no, like that, that, that's the kind of stuff that just pops well, yeah, in your that, head sometimes. That, and you're like, well, I don't know about this. Well, that's the risk, right? It's like, you know, it's all well and good to, like, go hang out with my girlfriend, but if she knew that, like, well, she's going to get, like, ice cream, I'm thinking about how to, like, saw someone's legs off. <laughs> it's not going to be it's not gonna be a great conversation afterwards, you know? It's like, is this not every time? Like... Yeah. <laughs> it's every single time. Yeah. There's something about ice cream that just triggers me. I think what it boils down to is that everyone, to some degree, is perverted and well, we don't ever show those sides of ourselves. Like, I know I have perverted thoughts, and I don't think I'm alone in that. I just don't want ever want that to yeah. get out, right? And the idea of experiencing someone else's perversion, uh, not willfully, is, is very haunting to me. I, I do not want to go there with anyone. <laughs> and it's a two-way street, right? It's like, that's why we think this book is so interesting, is because it's like, it's taking that filter off completely. It's taking away that control. And so it's like, you know, imagine being exposed to someone's thoughts like a fire hose and just being blasted with them. And then all you can do is just like blast yours back. And it's like, that's overwhelming for everyone yeah. involved. Oh, like, it's, it, it is a, a harrowing just, experience that you could think of, of just like suddenly seeing all these things firsthand. I, I do really like the, um, 
the effect in the in the book that it it almost looks like it's a video screen that's kind of like you know flickering or like you know tracking on a VCR that is is that supposed yeah. to be like your uh, like the memories kind of like coming in and out yeah i mean it's it slowly builds over time and you'll kind of see where the origin of that comes from later on in the series but yeah we wanted to have some visual aesthetic that really shows that memories are blurry and memories don't make a whole lot of sense and they do distort. And uh, from every bit of research that we've done, it's like your memory is not this like finite thing where you're just able to go and like find this artifact and it always remains the same. It's like it changes completely. It changes from day to day. Yeah. Well, that's why like, uh, you know, eyewitness testimony isn't really that valuable in the scheme of things when it comes to criminal cases and stuff, because you, you kind of remember something and then as you talk and you you kind of formulate that memory in your mind as to what happened but then there was what really happened and they can be two different things despite you seeing it firsthand yeah, yeah exactly from from what i've seen for most of what um black mask has done it seems like it's, it's usually like a probably a four issue miniseries is that the case with uh with this that one? is the case yeah it is uh gonna end in a really really interesting way where it's gonna probably blow people's minds a little bit <laughs> at least upset them yeah or upset them to the point where they never want to talk to us ever again <laughs> that's not your goal is it of just like let's see how many people we can alienate i remember it was like we came up with the idea for it and we were like we can't do this and then we were like we gotta do we this we can't not do this yeah <laughs> i remember telling one of our close friends about the ending and he was just like fuck you that is the worst <laughs> thing i've ever heard <laughs> Oh man, I can't wait to see this now. This, <laughs> this, uh, yeah, I mean it, that. Uh, I, I guess that's that's part of it. But yeah, like you do want to shock the reader, and I think if any place, if you're gonna do that in anywhere, doing it at Black Mask is probably the best place to do it because I feel like they're the publisher that's going to take the most kind of chances with something like that. I'm just like, yeah, yeah let's I- let's freak people out. Let's really, you know, go out there and and try something different. Yeah, and at Black Mask, there's a lot of freedom, and uh, even though this is only four issues, each issue is oversized compared to a regular 20-page comic, so I think the first issue is almost 30 pages, the next issues are all 24, so it ends up being around the same length as five issues, um, but for the price of four, which is, is good for us, but the point being that there's a lot of freedom to experiment at Black Mask and sort of do whatever we want, mm-hmm. um, and uh, Matt Pozzolo, the publisher who just puts way too much trust in us uh lets us tell the stories we want to tell and he likes when things are pushing boundaries and he likes when things are challenging the status quo that's what he sort of built the company on that's the books that he writes himself i mean Uh, like we we basically told him like the book got greenlit based on us going like this is what we want to do with this book and he was like he didn't even really get all the plot details he was like all right don't let's do this (laughs) <laughs> like this gang we want this is the like this is how we want to make people uncomfortable about this social thing and then i remember like he was like yeah sounds good like it's greenlit let's go and then like a couple days later we got an email he's like so what's it about <laughs> <laughs> so is that after the dregs was is that how you kind of landed a black mask for uh coming to me yeah this, yeah this happened like right after to be honest, like we right after the dregs came out, it was like around issue two had just been released, and the book was getting a lot of like positive praise, and and we had been approached by a couple different publishers, and we had this book, and we knew this is going to be our next book, but we didn't really know where it was going to go, and every conversation that we had with people, we felt like with this book in particular, it was going to be changed or altered in some way that wasn't true to the original vision that we had for it. Mm-hmm. And so we knew that Black Mask was the only place that was going to let us do this insane thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, Black Mask, we really owe our whole careers to this point and to Matt Pozzolo. He was the only publisher that took a risk with us on the dregs because the pitch was, uh, I mean, the pitch was the first five pages of that book and there's somebody getting castrated on the third page. <laughs> For most publishers, they were just like, I don't, I don't want this. I can't sell it. And uh, for we're some reason, like, he what? was like, "This is awesome." Yeah, yeah they're <laughs> so. like, "Yeah," or they're just like, "Man, this is the fifth castration story I've read today." <laughs> like, it's super fun looking back to think that that's like we thought that was going to be like 
like marketable. So ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody gets castrated and then they get beheaded, and we're like, people are gonna want this for sure. And they're turned into sausages, and people are eating it in a restaurant. We're like, don't you want to buy our book? Yeah. And they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is not something we want to publish. So it's pretty cool to find Pizzolo. <laughs> yeah, he's. Uh, they've been making a lot of really great books lately, especially genre books for us. So it's a. Uh, it's it's really cool to see what they might have coming next and it, it it sounds like coming to me is uh is right up right right fitting right in with everything else that they're doing there yeah their lineup this year is pretty crazy the wild is a book that comes out from uh vita ayala and emily pearson the week before coming to me and we've read it and it's it's really it's great really great yeah, yeah. I, like a, I had them on the show um a few weeks back so uh that i'm really awesome. looking forward to that too that looks really awesome yeah, that's a good one. And then what else do they have this year? Breathless. Yeah, Breathless. Breathless. I had I had Pat on the show too. Yeah, I'm I'm making the rounds of the Black Mask roster <laughs> lately. So yeah, uh, amazing. <laughs> it's all good. I guess going back to um the 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 horror genre a bit. You you said you were really into horror. Like, do you remember your your kind of gateway uh horror story or horror movie that kind of really like got you into it? Yeah, I, horror was weird for me. Like, I loved it as a kid. Like from a young age. I was the kind of kid that was always reading Goosebumps and I was watching the show and I was watching Are You Afraid of the Dark, like obsessively. Uh, and I was always drawn to those sort of dark things and monsters. And then I fell out of it when I was in like middle school and early high school because I thought I was too cool for it. <laughs> and then uh, I think it was The Exorcism of Emily Rose came out when I was in high school and 1408 and 30 Days of Night. And it was just like this amazing time for horror. And I started watching them. And then I started watching other stuff like uh, Evil Dead and stuff I hadn't seen before. And it was like basically from grade 11 until now, I've, I've relentlessly watched horror movies. Like I, I grew up, uh, my earliest memory of horror movies is my older brother forcing me to watch Day of the Dead, um, the <laughs> scene where Rhodes gets decapitated. Um, and he made, he rewinded it multiple times because of his like voice box rips out as he's, as he's screaming. Such a good scene. And he made me watch it so many times that I threw up my craft dinner spaghetti that I had, <laughs> had earlier. And then later on in life, like that was like I was like six or seven. And then my mom took me to see the uh, Blair Witch Project in theaters in '99. Oh man, I was 11 years old. <laughs> I was a little wow. and like. I, I lived across the street from a forest and I don't know if you've ever heard like sound foxes make when they're like grunting or groaning. No, I just heard that but, song because everyone was trying to find out what the fox says like two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I woke up in the middle of the night and that was happening and I, I literally slept in my parents' bedroom for a year after wow. that. After Blair Witch in theaters. Yeah, my mom, I was watching, I was flipping through the TV when I was like 13 years old, I think, 12 or 13. And uh, I came across The Exorcist. It was on, like, daytime television for some reason. <laughs> and I was watching it, and my mom came in the room, and I changed the channel, uh, and she was like, what are you watching? And I was like, oh, nothing. And then she's like, go back. And then she was like, oh, I, I really like this movie. You want to watch it? And I was like, no. And she's like, you're going to watch it. And she forced me to watch it. I was terrified for weeks after that. That's great. Yeah, I, I it's it, the Blair Witch thing I can relate to. I, I saw that. Um, I don't know. I, I remember seeing it in the theater with a buddy of mine, and it's like afterwards, like we we, we came home, like there we lived in like a wooded area, and he's like, "Oh, let's just drive out into like the woods over here." I was like, "What are you fucking crazy? Like, no, like <laughs> I'm never setting foot in the woods again. Like this is I'm pretty good. Like I I never it's pretty safe bet that we're never gonna have to do that." And that was a cool thing because of the whole like bef- pre-internet days where it's like, did that really happen? Um. You you had that kind of air of mystery to it that you can't really get too much nowadays, unfortunately. Yeah, well, I'm so jealous you guys got to have that experience. I didn't see the Blair Witch Project till I was like 24 years old. Yeah. There'll never be another moment like that, right? That's the that's the beauty of it. Yeah, that um, I try, the the closest other things I could think of are like what hap- what seems to happen with like the Cloverfield movies now lately, where it's just all of a sudden like, hey, we made a movie, uh, here it is. Uh, and then, like, we have no real warning of it, and then it just kind of drops. But even that's, like, you know, that that's a, a a different anomaly, I feel. But, yeah, like, that that kind of uh, sudden, uh, you know, discovery that you can have, like, without really knowing the full extent of it. But I, I, could, I can really, like, I didn't see The Exorcist until, like, 
two or three years ago. Uh, so it was something that like I just was never exposed to, and then I saw it, and, and it really it lived up to the hype. It was very much, um, uh, you know, worthy of all the praise it's gotten. Yeah, it's like one of the few movies when people say it's like the greatest movie of all time. It's like, yeah, it is one of the greatest horror movies of all time. Like, no matter who watches it, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it, it really it stands the test of time. Yeah. yeah, no matter who you are. <laughs> Uh, and then from uh, from getting into comics, was there a were you was this something you were always interested in, or did you kind of uh, go come into it later on in life? Yeah, I mean, for me, comics and horror were always part of my life. Growing up, my brother would buy comics from uh, from like the corner store, and I would always look at them and read them. And I was a huge fan of the X Men and Spider Man and Batman animated series. Um, and I would always just have comics around and I'd be reading them. I didn't really understand that you were supposed to read them in order. Mm -hmm. So I would just read like random issues until I was like 12 years old and figured it out. Um, and yeah, again, I like, I fell off of comics for when I was in middle school for a bit and then picked them back up when I was in grade 11 or 12. And from there, it's just, uh, I haven't stopped. Yeah, I mean, I, I started reading, like, X-Men comics in the mid-90s, like, just out of sequence, like, Lonnie, just, like, I didn't really know, but they were, like, serialized storytelling, so it was, like, I think, like, Age of Apocalypse was going on, and I was just like, oh, cool, like, <laughs> X-Men is cool, and, like, Gambit's cool. That's, like, the yeah, worst like, well, the worst time to no. possibly jump in to, to start reading X-Men, yeah. is, is during a weird the- alternate universe storyline. <laughs> Dude, and the cruel irony of it is now we're fucking writing cable. It's just like it's, it's so funny because it's like we grew up in the '90s and we were and first assignment is the most '90s character <laughs> of all time. Yeah, is that are there? Do you have interest? I like I I, I haven't I I've, I've fallen off of the of the Marvel train for a bit and I've been trying to get back in like a weird game of double dutch. But um, <laughs> when you when you approach something like cable, is that do you? Do you approach that differently than? Well, I mean, I would assume you than you do for like your your previous work, like the Dregs and uh, and and now coming to me, or do you try to like so the, see what kind of fucked up stuff you could put into that book too? Yeah, a bit of both. <laughs> yeah, it's like a yeah, exactly. Um, there is body horror in Cable now. <laughs> like, uh, we got away with something in a big way, and we're just kind of like they don't they don't realize what we're doing here <laughs> and it's kind of excellent uh and it's also dealing with like memory and like our, our whole arc of cable is told backwards so you see what happens last first in the first issue and then you go backwards through his memories as he's experienced something that's irreparably changed him forever and like i don't know how that pitch got approved and how we got through with it but like they were really into it and so yeah. But at the same time, we have to curb a lot of stuff because Zach and I have a tendency to write a lot of panels on a page and we have a tendency to write really long descriptions. And we handed out our first script to our, our editor there, Darren Shan, and he, he's been amazing, but he was kind of like, guys, you got to cut like 75% of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not how we write. And he was like, well, that's how we do it at Marvel. And, and I was like, like okay. okay. <laughs> you want that Marvel money, you're going to have to do this. <laughs> Now, yeah. yeah, so I'm just, I'm, I'm, so is Cable then just the prequel to, uh, to, to come into me? Is that, is that the deal? No, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you gotta start, you gotta, you start the show there, then uh, you move it on to, 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 to come into me. Yeah. No matter where we go, Body Horror seems to come with us. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, we never wanted to, like, be pigeonholed into anything, but it's, we have a bunch of stuff like that just, in the works. It's, it's honestly, like, it's the type of thing where we write it, and we don't even realize it until we see the art, and we're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I did it again! Oh, man! <laughs> like, we'll start with, like, a super innocent concept. It's like, I don't know, let's do, like, a, a horror story about a girl in the woods, and it's like, yeah, and then there's, like, mushrooms growing on her face, and we're like, what? No, where did that come from? Stop, stop. Like, yes, okay, like, do, do you, it! Yeah, I can just imagine you guys pointing fingers at each other. Did you add the mushrooms? No, no, was that... No, that was you! That was totally you! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess it's it would be kind of weird to be labeled as the body horror guys, but if it works, like go for it. I mean, I, I'm sure there are worse things that could that you could be labeled as. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I'm I'm kind of at a point where I'm like, all right, let's just lean in. Let's see what, <laughs> see what happens. See how far this boat takes us. Yeah. 
Well, it sounds like from from what I've read with coming to me and and uh, and, and with your previous work, yeah, that those are pretty some pretty creepy ass places. So it's it's right up our alley here. Um, but certainly, so um, guys, this is this has been a, a blast talking to you, <laughs> to you about this book. Um, what are the where are the best places for uh, folks to find you online? Um, I mean, we're both fairly active on Twitter. Too active. Yeah, my <laughs> handle is Zach B E Thompson. Um, and mine is lawn underscore monster. That's it. That's the only place you can find us. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, <laughs> sounds good. And otherwise, it looks like um, the first issue of Coming to Me comes out on March seventh. Uh, is that That's right? Fun. Yeah. So yeah. yeah um, look, I've uh, I've read it. It's definitely worth checking out. Uh, really, look if 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 all the body horror talk didn't uh, get get you know sell sell you on this already, then I don't know what else to tell you. But um, yeah, you can. Uh, I'll be I'll be writing up a review for it um, as well. But look, uh, you know, definitely look for this out in the comic shops now. It's it's going to be worth it. Um, but yeah, guys, thanks again um, for chatting with me. I think that kind of wraps it up for us uh, here on this episode of Funny Book Splatter. I have been James Ferguson with my guests Lonnie Nadler and Zach Thompson. You've been listening to Funny Book Splatter, a horror comics podcast brought to you by HorrorTalk.com. We've been bringing you the best in horror since 2002. In addition to comics, we cover movies, TV shows, books, and video games. We've got news, reviews, guest features, interviews, unboxing videos, and much more. Be sure to sign up to Steve's Deals newsletter to increase your horror collection without breaking the bank. Check us out at HorrorTalk.com and at HorrorTalk on Twitter.